Lord gave me something that I feel like is, is God's heart for tonight, and uh, instead it is Jesus, our root. And so if you want to turn to Isaiah 53, and we're going to uh, read verses 1 and 2 tonight. And, um, but uh, hopefully the Lord will help me to minister this in the way that I feel like the Holy Spirit would want me to. And uh, minister to all of us tonight. So Isaiah chapter 53, and I'm going to start reading with verse 1. Who has believed our message? This I'm reading out of the New American Standard. Some of these verses I read for so many years out of the King James that uh, I, I still find myself wanting to quote King James in the New American Standard. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, or a tender root, like a root out of parched ground or dry ground, and he had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Father, we just come before you tonight. We ask, Lord God, for your anointing as we minister your word tonight. Lord, I ask that your heart uh, would be shared here, Lord God, and, and that, Father, you would express yourself through my personality tonight, through the ministry of your word tonight that you would be able, Father, to communicate to your people. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe when Isaiah talks about Jesus being the root, I believe that what Isaiah is really talking about is that the essence of who God is in your life, sooner or later, the essence of who God is is going to be beneath ground. It's going to not be what people see about you it's not going to be what people are able to watch in your actions. It's going to be who you are in the unseen places of your life. I preach this, and I and I know uh, sometimes I'm careful because I, you know, I was under Pastor Kevin, and I and I watched Pastor Kevin get stuck in something, and and I understand now why he would get stuck, and he would get stuck in themes, and he would get stuck on subjects, and didn't seem and and, and many times they were themes and subjects of frustration. But I understand a lot about that because, see, you may be the only person in your world that uh, has happened, what is happening in your life is <clears throat> happening only to you, but when you're in ministry, you not only sometimes watch it happen multiple times all at the same time, but you've also watched it year in and year out, year in and year out. And I said that to say this, that sooner or later, I'm not nearly as scared of the devil as I am I'm scared of life. I would be the first one to tell you, I don't fear the devil, I fear life. Because I've watched enough people to know that life can do things to you that you never thought would happen. Never. And please hear this. If I could, but I think I'd be on, maybe I'm not be on that. I, I would pound this pulpit until I would get every one of your attention. But I'm going to tell you something. If you do not have a prayer life before life slaps you in the face, you're not going to be able to get a hold of one most of the time in it. That is the truth. Brothers and sisters, I believe Jesus, at some point, I, I believe God is the essence. Really serving God. Roots are all about what people do not see. The, the truth is, everything that God is going to do with us, can do with us, everything God will allow uh, to be put on us, is conditional to the person that nobody sees but you and God. The time that nobody sees you seek in the face of the Lord but you and the Lord. The things that are happening in your life, the things you're allowing God to build, deal with. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. People, you could put all people into two categories. People that are concerned with what people know and people that are concerned with what God knows. Yeah. All people can fall into one of those two categories. But the essence of God, I believe, the essence of God, and I believe this is how the Spirit of God deals with us, the essence of God is what is root. Roots, nobody sees a root. The only way 
that, in fact, most things, most things that you see in the natural are sitting on things you don't see. A house is sitting on a foundation you can't see, but that house is no sturdier than its foundation is. A tree is no more uh, trustworthy than its root system is. And we're going to get to some things tonight. I want to I talk about, I originally started out with three attacks against the roots, but I grew to five. You know me. God can start out with something really simple and say, do this. I say, oh no, Lord, that's not good enough. I got to do And so anyway, now it's grown to five attacks against the roots. Yeah. Hang on. I, I, I taught this to Timothy I was just today. And, by, and today, earlier today, it was three attacks, wasn't it, guys? Now it's already grown to five. Probably by Sunday, it'll be 15. <laughs> but anyway, uh, what, what your life is dependent on is what's underground. It's not what's above ground. It's what's below ground. I can't emphasize this enough. I think a whole message could be preached on just that part of it, but I don't have time to do that. I want to talk about five attacks against your root system. And I believe the Lord put this in my heart for tonight. Number one, tragedy. The first attack against your root system is tragedy. I want you to turn your Bibles real quickly to Job chapter 14. Job chapter 14. Tragedies come in all types of stripes, in different ways for different people. If you read Facebook, you know that Ashlyn uh, talked about this a little bit. Going for a, a walk, you know, going for a hike. Uh, and the other day, just another hike, has lunch, enjoying her family, and all of a sudden slips off a 30-foot cliff backward. And her whole life changes. Split her spine in two. Uh, by a miracle, a true miracle of the Lord. Um, she is walking again. I believe God is going to give a full recovery to that young lady. 20 years old. Just starting her life. And what I've lived, I was with Wally today. And if the Lord doesn't intervene in, in Wally's life, well, Wally didn't have long. And uh, I sat with him today and and the Bible says that, it actually says this in Job 2, it says, the blessings of those that are about to perish came on me. And you know, I, I've studied that for a long time, and, and I believe, I've wondered a long time, what is the blessings of those that are getting ready to die? He said, the blessing of those that are getting ready to die come upon me. You know what I think that is? When you're getting ready to die, your priorities are right. Oh, yeah. All the, all the yeah. garbage... All the useless worries, all of the useless things that we let afflict our life, our mind, whatever. It's all by the wayside now. You're staring eternity right in the eye. I was with him and I was talking about this with him earlier today. Verse 7. I want to start in verse 7. It says, For there is hope for a tree when it is cut down that it will sprout again. And its roots will not fail. Though its roots grow old in the ground and its stump dies in the soil, in the dry soil, at the scent of water it will flourish and put forth sprigs like a plant. I want to say something. Tragedy in your life. This is so important. It is very important. I'm going to get to this a little bit later. It's very important that you care about what people think, but that you don't care about what people think. Because there's times... Job's life looked like it was like God had swiped it. Everything above ground was gone. His family was gone. His blessings were gone. His, his, uh, his money was gone. Everything, his health was gone. And if you were looking at Job's life from above ground, you would say that man's life is over. God has judged him and it's over. I was telling the Timothy House guys today, I can't tell you how many times in 21 years in the low ebb of this church's history, at least under my ministry, I remember one time in particular I was sharing this with Timothy House. Because you see, in times like this, if there's still something underground, I don't care how messed up your life is with what people see, if there's still something underground, I can't tell you how many times on the surface it looked like it was over. Close the doors and move on. But there was something in my life underground. Sooner or later it's about what's underground. Brothers and sisters, 
Sisters, that is so true. It is just so true. Job's life on the surface looked like it was over. I was telling the guys I remember several years ago, we were at a low ebb here. And some smart aleck young guy walked into church on a Wednesday night over the other building and said very loudly from the back of the sanctuary, well, I remember when this was packed out on a Wednesday night. What happened here? And in my flesh, I want to just pop it right in the mouth. And I'll tell you something, it's important that you're aware of what people think, but that in the end, you don't care. You get on your face and say, that may be your opinion, but as long as there is a God in heaven, and as long as I have the ability to cry out to Him, I'm going to get before God in the time nobody sees. I'm going to pray this thing back to life. I'm going to fast it back to life. I'm going to, I'm going to grab it back to life. You know, my daughter was talking to me after Joni and Brian's wedding on Saturday. And she was talking about a particular young man that was very interested in her for a long time. She told me this. She said, Dad, you know why I never went after him? And I said, nope. To be honest, never really cared. I mean, I would have cared if she would have went after him. I said, she didn't. I didn't. But this is what she told me. She said, he had no fight. Wow. He had no fight. And man, if that's a quality, if that isn't a quality, we need yeah. in men and women of God. So many, when it looks like it's over, to them it's over. If I would have moved according to what I've seen, it would have been over for me a long time ago. Brothers and sisters, you're either going to be moved by what you see or by what you hear. And I'm telling you something, I told Cindy, I've had a, it's been a, Hard day today. Been a hard six months. Been a hard year. 2016 has been a tough year. But I was out here praying last night, and the Spirit of God came upon me. I'll tell you something. There's nothing like private times of prayer where you can just shout and yell and scream, and nobody's here to worry about. I mean, if you would have saw me here last night, you would have thought he's lost his cotton dick in mind. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the Spirit of God came over me. And I'm telling you, I was prophesying, I'm not kidding, I was prophesying to these walls, prophesying to that modular, prophesying to that old building, prophesying to the parking lot. I am telling you something. This, this man, his life on the surface, everything above ground, gone. But he said, but if there's something left underground, at the scent of water, at the scent of the Spirit of God, do you know something? You, 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 you probably know this, but do you know that a tree, if it's planted by a pipe that has water running through it, the root will grow to the pipe. It, sense, it senses water. I'll tell you something. This is true. There's not many... Comparatively, there's not many of us in the kingdom. But there's some that all they need is a scent of hope. Yeah. Hey! Yeah. All they need is a scent of hope. Yeah. All they need is a scent of the presence of God. And something rises within them. Yeah. It says, I'm not done. This thing's not over. God is able. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Brothers and sisters, there's nothing that replaces just good old-fashioned fight. Yes. Just good old-fashioned fight. Yes. Hallelujah. Number two, the second attack against roots is discipline. The discipline of the Lord. Turn your Bibles to Daniel. Have you ever been disciplined? Anybody ever been disciplined? I mean discipline. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody ever been taken to the woodshed by the Lord? Yeah. Yep. How many know that God can bring you to the edge of thinking He's going to kill you? And bring you back. 
Daniel chapter 4. Listen to verse 23. Dan, that Nebuchadnezzar is describing to Daniel a dream that, he's, that Nebuchadnezzar's had. And he said, in that dream, king, there were, you saw an angelic watcher, a holy one descending from heaven, saying, chop down the tree and destroy it. Listen to that. Chop everything down above ground. You know, God can get attention, your attention, so easy by just chopping everything down that's above ground. I mean, He makes a wreck of everything that's above ground. But this is the good thing. Listen to what He says. Yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground. <laughs> Glory to God. And He says, and put a band of iron and bronze around it with the new grass. You know what He's saying? He's saying, I'm going to chasten you, Nebuchadnezzar. And I'm going to take away everything above ground, but I'm going to put bands of brass around your roots. I'm going to make sure you're going to make it through this thing. I mean, listen, brothers and sisters, oh, the Lord can spank you hard. I mean, I, when Cindy and I first got married, you know, I'm sure if she were completely honest, she probably would say, with Jesus, Lord, if there be another way. <laughs> if, there, if there could have been somebody besides Him, Lord. That we, we've been through seasons of chastening. And most of it, maybe all of it, was my fault. And I would look at Cindy when we were young, and I would say, that the, the, the Lord knows we're human. And I said, His chastening won't last forever. Yeah. I'll tell you something. A good parent doesn't chasten to destroy. He chastens to develop. And I'll tell you something, sometimes the Lord can come down on you, but I'm telling you, to the degree God chastens you is to the degree God has a plan for you. Yeah. I'm serious. The, the Bible says God doesn't chasten bastards. Hebrews. Yeah, I'm just using the lingo he used. Yeah. The Lord does not chasten bastards. The Lord doesn't chasten those that are not his. Yeah. He chastens those that are and that's why the Bible says that there can be joy in our heart when we're being chastened by the Lord. Yes. Yes. Because it, it, it tells us we belong to Him. But I'll tell you something, when you're being chastened by God, it hurts. And here's the worst thing. You are a spectacle to everybody. People can say many times whatever they want to. And nobody's going to stand up and argue with them. Let me tell you something. Very few people, when you have made a mistake and you're, and you're undefendable, very few people are going to stand up and say, hey, wait a minute. They may have made a mistake, but I know them. Brother, can we, can we agree, brothers and sisters, that most people, maybe all people in some ways, are not what they do? Can we agree on that? Yes. That doesn't make what they do okay, but it's a reality. That most people are not what they do. Listen, what God is saying is if you'll trust Him, this is good stuff. If you'll trust Him, God will put a band around your roots. When you're being chastened and it looks like everything above ground is being taken away, God is saying, I'm going to put, I'm going to put a band around your room. And I'm going to make sure. Yeah, how many? See, I, I like to, I, the older I get, uh, I'm just weirding myself out. Because look at these shoes I'm wearing tonight. These are old guy shoes. Like, these, are like, these are like... These are shoes 55 year olds wear. Marty stands up to see him. Let me see him. But I, the older I get, I like to do yard work more than I ever used to. It's kind of therapeutic. And it's, it's mindless. And so much of what ministry is, you're in your head so often. And sometimes you just go out and mow the lawn. It's just like, this is awesome. You know, just dirt and dust blowing up in your face. And, you know, afterwards you got those big old black boogers that come out. <laughs> it dirt and dust, you know. Anyway, yeah, that's nice. But what I, what I think is amazing is, and I think this is so true, you can... You can dig out a plant, a weed, 
until you can't see anything left of it on the surface. But if you didn't get the root, the very next week, five days later, it's back. I'll tell you something, the devil can get to a lot in your life, but if he doesn't get to your root, come on, if he doesn't get to your root, you're coming back. Come on, you're coming back. I don't know how many times I have told the devil, devil, after a bad service, a bad season, I'm still here. I still got a root in the ground. I still got a root in the ground. As long as you still have a root in the ground. would be a root out of dry ground. Let me tell you something. Jesus can handle dry times. Yeah. If you're in a dry time, Jesus can handle dry times. He is the root that grew out of dry ground. Yeah. I'm telling you, Jesus didn't need anybody else to believe Him. He didn't need anybody to confirm Him. He didn't need anybody to tell Him He was who He was. He simply had God. He had the Spirit of God. And I'm telling you, you don't need anybody. Let people say, Glory to God. The Bible says dry times are when demons attack. Matthew 12, 43 says demons go through dry places. Ezekiel 37, 2 says their bones were very dry. They were torn apart. Warfare had done its job to the army of Ezekiel 37, 2. It split the pieces. Number three... Listen to this. I want to talk about what dry seasons really are. They're the beginning of a new season. The Bible says Joshua and Moses walked across dry ground into the promised land. Telling you, on the other side of a dry season is a new season. The Bible says Elijah and Elisha walked on dry ground. On the other side of your dry season is a new mantle. There's a new mantle. Listen, I don't know if anybody else in this house needed hope tonight. I needed hope tonight. And I'll tell you, you may have been through a season where the devil knocked your lips off. But I'm telling you, on the other side of your dry season is something fresh in your life. God is always... I love that, that part of... That song, Oceans, where it says, you've never failed me, and you're not going to start now. Yeah. Amen. I failed God. God's never failed me. Amen. Brothers and sisters, man, I've made, my ministry would be marked by mistakes. And getting on my face and saying, God, help me. God, help me to get out of this. Listen. What dry seasons need is answers. Listen, what dry seasons need is water. There's three different types of water I want to talk about. Number one, rain. Rain speaks of in 1 Kings 18.45. The Bible says that rain fell for the first time in three and a half years. And it was the beginning of a whole new season for the nation of Israel. Rain is a fresh start. Rain is a new place. Rain washes away what used to be and brings something new. I'll tell you, I don't know about you, but see, I came here in the spring of the year, April 1988. April the 15th. And in April and May, you get all that rain, and it brings a smell. There's a certain smell here when it rains in April, May, and June. 
And every time it rains, and I smell that, I remember April of 1988. It was a new season for me. And I'll tell you something, rain from God washes away things. Number two, there's the mist of the Lord. In Daniel chapter 4, it says God would bring Nebuchadnezzar back from his being obliterated by mist. In fact, it says seven times God would send a mist over his life and it would help restore it. You see, a mist, what's different from a mist than a rain is a mist isn't so noticeable. A mist is more the unnoticeable moving of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's not necessarily this one powerful moment. It's just many little ones where God meets you and gives you hope and gives you a promise and gives you something to stand on over and over and over again. And lastly, this is good. Lastly, the answer to, uh, especially to dry ground in their, in their world, was a river. Now, it's not a river like we think of a river. In Psalm chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, trees planted by the rivers of living water, that's actually a canal. It's a man-made irrigation canal. It's not a river. Yeah. And you see, God uses people. God uses people to bring water into your life. God will have people that will come in at the right time with encouragement and a word and love you and help you. And I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters, you'll remember those people for the rest of your life. The fourth enemy of roots, this is so true, is pruning. Pruning. Pruning is easy to misunderstand. Pruning is easy to assume that you're under judgment. Pruning, Satan will tell you, your ministry life is over. Pruning, the, the, Satan will tell you, you're not being used anymore. See, what pruning is, this is interesting, pruning is an emphasis on the root, not the fruit. Pruning makes what's visible smaller to make what is invisible bigger. Because all of the juices and the sugars that normally go into all these branches, what you're trying to do is keep it in the root system. So the root system gets bigger so that in the future, what is seen will be bigger, but right now, what is unseen is getting bigger. What am I saying? I'm saying there's seasons that God is working on who you are, not what you do. Come on! I mean, I don't know about you, that is shouting stuff! That gives me peace. There are seasons where God is working on who I am, not what I'm doing. And I like this book I read. My sister gave me a book years ago on this truth. And she said this, or the, the author said this. He said he was a, a, a vineyard owner in Italy. And the man that wrote the book went there on purpose because he wanted to see a vineyard owner deal with a vineyard. Okay. And he's out early in the morning and the guy wakes up late and he walks down there and the, and the vineyard owner is already hacking away and pruning his vineyard. And he's taking 20-foot vines from the year before and lopping them off. He brings a vine that was probably 20 feet from one end to the other. And by the time he's pruning it, it's this big. And the man writing the book said, you're killing it. And he said, if that vine could talk, that's probably what it thinks. If it could talk, it would say, you're killing me. But what actually is happening is I'm taking all of the energy that was going into those branches and I'm focusing it in the root system and forcing it down into the roots so that next year and the next year and the next year it will produce three times what it did last year. But see, I'm going to tell you something. When you're being pruned, the devil will tell you, because how many people, there? most people are focused strictly on the outside. The moment your ministry has a bad day, oh God, right, no, what, what happened? What are they doing? What's wrong with them? Come on. You've thought it. We've all thought it. And you look at your own life and all those voices do is confirm what the devil's already telling you in your own head. Brothers and sisters, listen. The answer to pruning is understanding. 
Turn your Bibles over to Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. Listen to this. This is powerful to me. So much is said in this little verse. Joel chapter 3 and verse 10. Listen to this. You're saying, I am listening. Stop saying listening to this and read it. Right? It says, the day will come. Sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter. It says that, that this is the Holy Spirit saying, beat your plowshares into swords. Listen to this. Or this is this is backward. This is not the other one. I is what I wanted. Is it's in Isaiah. It just turns this around. And it, here it says, and turn your pruning hooks into spears. But the other one says, turn your spears into pruning hooks. You see, there's a season where you're fighting to expand that your weapon returns in to a pruning hook that prunes. So you're, you're in a season, when you have a sword, you're in a season where you're fighting to expand territory and then all of a sudden there's a season it's switched and your weapon now is a pruning hook hacking things away. Why, what God is focused on what's beneath ground. There's seasons of your life that God doesn't care. God, it's not a fruit season, it's a root season. It's not a fruit season, it's a root season. And if you don't have some root seasons, you know what you turn into? You turn into the preachers in Matthew that said, did we not do wonderful things in your name? It's all about works. It's all about producing. There's got to be seasons in your life that it's not about fruit, it's about root. Last thing. This is good. The last attack against a root system is people giving up on you. Turn your Bibles over to Luke chapter 13. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish early even. Luke what? Luke chapter 13. Luke 13 verse 6. Listen, when you're in a... When you're in a, when you're in a, a, a non-fruit bearing season... It's easy to judge people. This is verse 6. And he began telling him this parable. A certain man had a, a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it and didn't find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, For three years I have come looking for fruit in this fig tree, and I have found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? So let me tell you something. You may be in a hard season right now. And there's people that they're just looking for, for. There's people that have given up on you. Saying, cut it down. Get it out of my way. This is very, 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 very powerful attack of the enemy. One of the attacks against a, this tree in the natural is fighting to live. One man says it's useless. Three years it's done nothing. Get it out of here. But another man comes along and he said, well, wait a minute. If you'll just fertilize it, give me one more year. Give me one more year. Let me work with it one more year. Mm. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. God will send a person into your life that will say, you know what? Let's give it one more year. One of the great attacks against you when you are in a time that you're being pruned, you're going through a hard season, is when people give up on you. So important to have an attachment to the Lord. That's right. So important to have a private attachment to the Lord. Stand with me tonight. Jesus, the root. Jesus, the root. How many appreciate the Holy Ghost? Come on, you, you know that was the Holy Ghost. And she said this. She said, I don't mean to say anything rude, but she said, your most anointed message is on Wednesday nights. And you know why I believe that is true? Because God honors people that are hungry. Amen. Sunday morning is so traditional. But God honors people that are hungry. God honors people that are thirsty. Listen, if you're, if you're in this, if you're in any of this, if you're in a season in your life where 
It's uh, everything above ground seems to have been wiped away. But if there is still something left beneath ground, there's still something left where nobody sees. There's still something left underneath. I'm going to tell you something. You hang on. I am living proof. I'm living proof that you can do something that will seemingly wipe away all of what you thought you had. All of what you thought you were building. And, 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 and think it's over. But if there's something left underground, if there's something left in the privacy of your heart, God has no problem giving you life we all know the end of the story of Job. He ended up having twice as much as he went into that battle with. He came out of it with twice as much. Listen, if you're here tonight and you're in a season of pruning, you're in a season where you feel like everything above ground has been somehow taken away from you, you're in a season that's just hard. You're in a dry season. You're in a disciplinary season. You're in a season where you feel like that, that people have given up on you. I just want you to come. There's absolutely, an, and I, this goes without saying, there's no judgment in this house. There's only grace. There's only mercy. If you're in that place, would you come? We want to pray with you, gather people around you. We want to seek the face of the Lord for you. Hallelujah. Father, minister among us tonight. Hallelujah. Lay hands. Come on. Come on, church. Let's pray like we mean it. Let's pray out loud. Come on. Pray over these people. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we ask, Lord God, at the scent of water, at the scent of water, at the scent of water, Lord, I pray for the scent of water in this house tonight. I pray for the scent of hope tonight. I pray for the scent of, of, of love tonight, Lord God, that you just fall all over this house, Lord, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus.